So we are going to be in the fifth chapter, the final chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the first letter to the Thessalonian church. But uh, so far in this letter, in this letter that Paul has written, you can just tell how much he, or you ought to already tell by now, how much he really cares and loves this church. You know, he planted it, he nurtured it, he, he was there for the believers, good times, bad times. You know, he, he almost feels like, yeah, like a spiritual father to those believers there. And you know, he'd been through a lot already because of them. He was trying to get back to them, but the, we see in, in earlier uh, chapters that Satan prevented him from coming. And so he's just looking forward, coming back to them and, and ministering to them again. Now, in the previous chapter, we know that he had begun answering some questions that they had. Now, the first question that Paul addressed was on maintaining a respectful love for one another, a phileo love, a brotherly, you know, so I guess you could also say sisterly love towards one another by leading responsible lives so that they won't be a burden to one another and, and a burden to outsiders, unbelievers. And then he answered another question the last time we were here together. And he answered what he did there. He answered the question he answered had to do with the Lord's coming and what it meant for believers. And just to, again, recall your memory talked about again death of a believer, and also the rapture of the church. And, and now that, again, he, he touched on the subject of the Lord's coming and it had been mentioned, he can now bring up another concern that they had. So again, as we begin this chapter, Paul will answer the question, when will the day of the Lord arrive? An important question that believers have had since Jesus promised his return. Now, without a doubt, Paul, he taught them, he did. He instructed them and taught them about the return of Jesus and other prophetic matters while he was with them. But it seems that while he was away, there were some within the church that were trying to set up timetables in order to find the specific, find out the specific point in which Christ would return. So to clarify any confusion, to just bring it all together, just to, be, to make it clear, Paul here will now spend time to teach them about this final event, to inform them and encourage those believers in their daily lives and conduct. Now, this also applies to us believers right now here today. Because when we have a clear and correct understanding about the end, the things that are going to happen, it's going to help us to live uh, as true Christians right here, right now, in the present. And so I've titled today's message, Watching and Waiting, because that's what it, Paul is essentially asking these believers to do, is to live as children of light, as believers, to watch and wait, to know that He is coming. And so before I begin our first, our first part of our passage, or reading our first part of a passage, Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord, we come to you now completely dependent on you, Lord. Lord, in a, in a world that is fickle, is always shifting, you're our constant. You're our rock. You're our truth. Lord, we know that we can rely and depend on you because you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. 
and let your truths stand the test of time. Lord, as your children, we ask you that you help us in those areas that are weak, Lord. That you will give us the strength that we need in those times of doubt. That you will bring people along to encourage us, to comfort us, to help us look to you. We are, we are eager, waiting for your return because you, we have this wonderful promise that whether we live or die, we're going to be with you. So now, Lord, just continue to speak to us through the words that we're about to read. We, may your word just be implanted deep into our hearts and mind. fruit, precious and beautiful fruit, be born of it. I ask you to fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Keep us safe. Look forward to hearing from you now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 1, and the Word of God says about the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this, day, for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. Throughout the history of the church, it's been checkered with people and communities who believe that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt when Jesus, when his second coming would occur. One example that comes to mind, and maybe you're familiar with it as well, took place in Korea when a group of Christians believed that Christ would come again in October 1992. Some people believe this so fervently that they sold their homes and gave away their possessions. When a date came and went, there was despair on part of some. A few even took their own lives. Obviously, without exception, the expectations of each of these groups throughout history has been dashed. Such overtly definitive expectations did not arise only in the later parts of the church in later centuries. But these things have plagued the church from its earliest beginnings. So in these verses I just read, the emphasis is on the unpredictability of the time of the Lord's return. Now, from what Acts chapter 17 verse 2 tells us, in the few weeks that Paul was with the Thessalonians, he taught them about the prophetic times and seasons regarding the return of Jesus. And also at the end of chapter 4, he had spent some time explaining the rapture of the church that will precede the Lord's coming. So now here it appears that he didn't really want or didn't need to dive deeper into the subject. Why? Maybe asking, well, for one thing, believers, the saints, wouldn't um, be affected by them, wouldn't be affected by those, those events. They would, they would have uh, be taken to heaven again in the rapture before this time and season begins. <clears throat> 
also the times and the seasons and the day of the Lord are subjects that are found in the Old Testament. The rapture, on the other hand, was a mystery, never revealed until the time of the apostles. But in verse 2, he makes it clear that the saints already knew about the day of the Lord. Meaning they knew that the exact time was unknown and that it would come when they least expected. And so then, what does Paul mean by the day of the Lord? Well, it's definitively not a day of 24 hours but rather a period of time with certain characteristics. In the Old Testament, this term was to describe any time of judgment, desolation, and darkness. It was a time when God marched forth against the enemies of Israel and pushed them decisively. But it was also any occasion on which God punished his own people for their idolatry and backsliding. So basically, it spoke of judgment on sin, victory for a cause of the Lord, and untold blessing for his faithful people. Now, in the future, the day of the Lord will cover approximately the same period as the times and the season. It will begin after the rapture and will include the tribulation, otherwise known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the coming of Christ with his saints, the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, the final destruction of the heavens and the earth. The day of the Lord is a time when Jehovah God will publicly intervene in human affairs. It's characterized by judgment on the enemies of Israel and on the apostate portion of the nation of Israel, by deliverance of his people, by establishment of Christ's kingdom of peace and prosperity and glory for himself. And then now, Paul reminds his readers that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night meaning it will come completely unexpected, taking men and women off guard. So simply put, the world, the unbelieving world, will be completely unprepared for that time. In Matthew 24 and in Luke chapter 12, our Lord Jesus use this image in his own teaching. It describes the suddenness, the suddenness and surprise involved in the coming of the day of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 3 and 16, 15, he used this image to warn believers not to be caught napping. Thus, since we don't know when the Lord will return for his people, we must live in a constant attitude of watching and waiting while we're busy working and witnessing. We must live in a constant attitude of watching and waiting while we're busy working and witnessing. Now, Paul will explain more about the day of the Lord when we get to his second letter to the Thessalonians. So I will save these details for a later time. But again, the emphasis, his emphasis here was simply that the believers were in the know. In the know, while unbelievers while were living in ignorance of God's plan. The suddenness of these events will reveal to the world its ignorance of divine truth. Paul then goes on to say in verse 3, that this day will come deceptively 
suddenly, destructively, inevitably, and inescapably. There will be an air of confidence and security in the world such as never been felt or seen before. Then God's judgment will suddenly begin to descend with vast destructive force. Destruction doesn't mean loss of being or annihilation. It means loss of well-being or ruin as far as the purpose of one's existence is concerned. It will be as inevitable as, and unavoidable as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. On this judgment, there won't be any escape for unbelievers. Now, as he goes on, as he continues, it's important to notice the change in pronouns from they and them to you and we in the verses that follow. See, church, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the day of the Lord will be a time of wrath for them, them being the unsaved world. But to you, if you are a believer, to you and us, we, it means that we're not in danger. You know why? Because we're not in darkness. As he did in verse 2, at the end of verse 4, Paul emphasizes that this day will come as a thief in the night. See, my friends, the only way it will overtake anyone is as a thief. And the only persons it will overtake will be those who are in the night, that is, the unconverted. Now, nearly 20 centuries have come and gone since our Lord gave the promise of his return. And he hasn't yet. It hasn't happened. He hasn't returned yet. This doesn't mean that God doesn't keep his promises. It simply means that God doesn't follow our calendar. Let me remind you what it says in 2 Peter verse 3, verse 8, and I'm reading this from the NIV. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Back in verse 3, Paul compared the coming judgment to labor pains on a pregnant woman. Even with our modern medical skills, birth pains are very real and very painful. I haven't experienced them, but I've seen the face, that, the look of my wife's face when she was giving birth. And I know, I can see how much pain and discomfort she was in. This is after she was fully dilated and the drugs had worn off, and one day she can tell you what she experienced with our firstborn. But I remember looking through... <laughs> As they were prepping her for, you know, I was like, I saw her, what she was going. I was like, oh my goodness, I never seen anybody in that much, in that much pain and discomfort. I wanted to go in there and rescue her and help her. But for those of you who have experienced, those of you women who have experienced this, you know again that the, these pains are very real, and they're very painful. They accompany the muscle contractions that enable the mother to give birth to the baby. The prophet Isaiah used the same picture when, to describe, when he described the coming day of the Lord in Isaiah 13. The early part of this day of the Lord was called the beginning of sorrows by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24. And the Greek word translated sorrows actually means birth pains. What truth do Isaiah Jesus and Paul teach us with this description the truth that out of the day of the Lord will come the birth 
the glorious kingdom. When God's judgments are finished, God's Son will return with power and great glory. Paul described this event in his second letter to the Thessalonian Christians. Church, as believers, we ought to live expectantly. And what, I'm, what I don't mean by that is putting on a, a white sheet and sitting on top of a mountain. That's the very attitude God condemned in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. But it does mean living in the light of His return, realizing that our works, your works, will be judged and that our opportunities, our opportunities for service on earth will end. It means to live with eternity's values in view. See, there's a difference between being ready to go to heaven and being ready to meet the Lord. Anyone who has sincerely trusted Christ for salvation is ready to go to heaven. I am. I know you, all of you are too. Christ's sacrifice on the cross has taken care of that. But to be ready to meet the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ is simply something else. It's quite another matter. Sadly, Scripture does indicate that some believers aren't going to be happy to see Jesus Christ. It says in 1 John chapter 2, Verse 28, it says this, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Again, implying that there will be some that are not confident and ashamed. See, believers, those of you who have trusted in Christ those who have been born again, who live in the expectation of the Lord's return, will certainly enjoy a better life than Christians who decide to dabble in a little bit of this and a little bit of that, who say that, you know, it's no big deal if, you know, I play around with fire, I'm not going to get burnt. I remember when someone once told me, what if everything you believed was wrong? And you found that out after, then I'm going to die knowing I lived a good life, a satisfied life, that I cared for others, that I cared for my family, I led others to Christ, but I was doing the right thing. I would not have any regrets. I am enjoying my life. And it's a lot better now than in those years that I was compromising. Now, in the next verses we're about to read, Paul explained, will explain how being children of the light and children of the day ought to shape our views and behaviors. So let's pick up in verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. So then, let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. 
in verses 6, 7, and 8. Those verses call believers to live a life consistent with their exalted positions. This means watchful, watchfulness and sobriety. We're to watch against temptation, laziness, indifference, and distraction. Instead, we should watch for the Savior's return. The the word self-controlled here means um, not only in conversation and in general demeanor, but being temperate as far as what we eat and drink. The things we consume, controlling what we consume. Now in the natural realm, sleep is associated with night. The opposite is with me. I sleep during the daytime because of the hours I work, but typically sleep is associated with the night. So in the, so in the spiritual realm, careless indifference characterizes those who are sons of darkness, that is, the unconverted. Now, for the most part, we all know, again, men, men are, prefer or drunks, because it could be women or men, but you know, people prefer to carry out their drunken behaviors at night. They love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil, according to John chapter 3, verse 19. And one other thing about this here, I'm not sure if you knew this, but the, the very name nightclub links the idea of drinking and carousing with the darkness of the night of night. On the flip side, it says in verse 8 that those who are of the day should walk in the light as he is in the light. Who is he? It's Jesus. This means judging and forsaking sin and avoiding excesses of all kinds. It also means putting on the Christian armor, not on a temporary basis, not just for a while, but keeping it on. The armor consists of the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. In other words, the armor is faith, love, and hope. The three cardinal elements of Christian character. These are things that we talked about already in previous messages here in this letter. It's not necessary to press the details on the the breastplate and helmet because he had already spoken to them about that. The apostle here, Paul, is simply saying that the sons of light should wear the protective covering of a consistent and godly life. See, my friends, what preserves us from the corruption that is in the world through lust, what, is the, what are those things that, that protects us? Faith or dependence on God? Love for the, lo- love for the Lord and for one another the hope of Christ's return. Those things are what preserves us from the corruption that's in the world. Now, I want to share with you again some important, meaningful contrast that I see here in this chapter when it comes to unbelievers and, and believers. Unbelievers speaks of they. Believers speaks of you. Unbelievers speaks of sleeping. A believer speaks of not sleeping. Unbelievers in darkness. Um, 
believers not in darkness. Unbelievers overtaking, overtaken unexpectedly by the day of the Lord as a thief in the night. Believers not overtaken unexpectedly by the day of the Lord as a thief in the night. And unbelievers sudden and unescapable destruction as labor pains of a pregnant woman. And for a believer, not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now, I know I covered a lot of this last week, but or last time we were together, when I, we talked about the rapture, but the rapture has two aspects. Salvation and wrath. For the, for the believer, it means the consummation of his salvation in heaven. For the unbeliever, it means the ushering in of a time of wrath on earth. Since we are of the day, God did not appoint us to this wrath, which he will pour out in the great uh, tribulation period, but rather to salvation in its fullest sense. Freedom forever from the presence of sin. So do you get that? This is one of those verses that convinces me that we're, as believers, we're not going to go through the tribulation, that we're not appointed to wrath. There are many examples in the story where, in, in, in the Bible, stories in the Bible that God saves His people, His faithful ones, from coming wrath. Therefore, I believe from what Scripture tells me that we, as Christians, as born-again believers, we will not have to endure or suffer in that time, in that period of great tribulation when God's wrath will be poured out on earth. For me, that brings me relief. I don't want to go through that. I don't want to see it. I don't want to experience it. Some understand wrath here to refer to the punishment which unbelievers will suffer in hell. Now, of course, that's true. It is true that God has not appointed us to that. But it's gratuitous to introduce that thought here. Paul isn't talking about hell, but about future events on earth. The context here deals with the day of the Lord, the greatest period of wrath in the history of man on earth. You see, we don't have an appointment with the executioner. We have an appointment with the Savior. Some say the tribulation is the time of Satan's wrath, not the wrath of God. They say that the church will experience the wrath of Satan, but it will be delivered from the wrath of God in the second coming of Christ. However, there are several verses, and I'll give you a few examples if you are jotting them down. There are a few, there are a few verses that speak of the wrath of God and of the Lamb, and their setting is during the tribulation period. Those verses are Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 9, chapter 10, chapter 19, or uh, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verses 9, 10, and 19, chapter 15, verse 1, chapter 7, chapter 16, verse 1, and chapter 19. Again, all those in the book of Revelation. Verse 10, this verse emphasizes the tremendous price our Lord Jesus Christ paid to deliver us from the wrath and to ensure our salvation. As it says there in verse 10, He died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. 
Uh, there are two ways of understanding the expression, whether we wake or sleep. Some scholars understand it to mean living or dead at the time of the rapture. They point out that there will be two classes of believers at that time, those who have died in Christ and those who are still living. So the thought would be that whether we're among the living or the dead at the time of Christ's return, we shall live together with him. Christians who die lose nothing. The Lord explained this to Martha in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? The other view held by scholars is that wake or sleep means watchful or worldly. In other words, Paul is saying that whether we are spiritually alert or carnally indifferent to spiritual things, we will be caught up to meet the Lord. Our eternal salvation doesn't depend on our spiritual keenness during the closing moments of our time on earth. If truly converted, we will live together with him when he comes again, whether we're on our tiptoes, tip, whether we're on, our, on the tiptoes of expectancy or in the prone position of slumber. Our spiritual condition will determine our rewards, but our salvation depends on faith in Christ alone. Those who hold to the second view point out that the word for, for wake is the same word translated watch in verse 6. And the word for sleep is used in verse, verses 6 and 7 to mean insensitivity to divine things involving conformity to the world. But it's not the same word used in chapter 4, verses 13, 14, and 15, to mean death. So there are two, again, views by scholars. Paul then says in verse 11, that in view of so great salvation, in love for, in love for so great a Savior, and in the light of, of his soon return, we should exhort one another by teaching, encouragement, and example. And we should build each other up with the word of God and, and with loving care. Now, let me begin to conclude this message with a few points of application. First, since the coming of the day of the Lord is certain, and since we cannot know its precise timing, we must be ever watchful and waiting. We need to be aware that his delay is for at least two purposes. He is delaying out of grace, giving men, women, people further time to repent and believe. His delay also gives Christians more time to be purified by sanctification and thus be prepared for his return. Second, when we seek to interpret and apply our text, let us seek to identify Paul's purpose in writing it rather than impose our own desires and expectations on it. That's a, lot of mis that's a mistake a lot of people make when it comes to these passages like this. Now, personally, I think Paul is clear that his purpose isn't to supply additional details regarding the timing of our Lord's return, although he is intent on stressing the implications of his words, although he is intent on stressing the implication of his words. Since our Lord's return hasn't come as quickly as we may have hoped, and since we cannot know when 
the exact time of his return will be, we must wait and we must watch patiently. We must continue in the process of sanctification as God purifies us and prepares us for the day of his return. Friends, let us not seek to find what's not in our text. Let us seek, rather, to see what is there and what that means for us in terms of attitudes and actions in the light, in light of his sure return. Specifically, even though we may not, we may, uh, we have grown, we may have grown like the Thessalonians in our faith, love and hope, we're not to be content with with just the progress we've made. We can't just say, okay, I've made it. I'm done growing. No, not at all. We're to press on and grow even more in these areas. Paul has just given us one additional motivation for seeking to grow in faith, love, and hope. These three virtues are part of our spiritual armor that protect and keep us from difficult times we experience while waiting for his return. But since we are of the day, we must stay sober by putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet of our hope for salvation. Third, we should find our text here to be a warning regarding worldliness. Paul has made it clear in our text that unbelievers respond to the coming of the day of the Lord in a way that's opposite to that of a Christian. Not only does Paul exhort us to be different and to behave as children of the day, Paul's teaching here should serve as a warning to us. If we become too attached to this life and to this world, we'll be inclined to think and act as a world does regarding his return. See, my friends, worldliness will desensitize, desensitize us to the certain reality of the day of the Lord. The things, this world, the things of this world will no longer be seen as the passing pleasures of sin, and we will begin to pursue them rather than laying up treasures in heaven. Now, the flip side of this is that while we must guard ourselves against worldliness, we must also be diligent in maintaining our fellowship fellow believers. We can't stop meeting as a church. You can't start, stop meeting as with other believers, other Christians, even though you may think you're not a people person and you don't get along with other. No, the Lord makes it clear. The Bible makes it clear that we, the importance of fellowship, the importance of that community being part of a church Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The truths that Paul has set forth in verses 14 and verse in, in chapter 4, verse 13, all the way to verse 11 here of chapter 5, are those which provide us with the means to encourage our fellow believers. We're not only responsible to be personally alert and watchful and waiting, we are responsible to encourage our brothers and sisters in the Lord do likewise. So let me ask you, knowing this, after having said this, are you 
encouraging your fellow brother and sister in the Lord? Are you burdening them? Are you ignoring them? Are you avoiding them? Well, you got to know now, be an encouragement. You got to encourage them. You know, it's very easy to be the one, I need all the encouragement. Look at my life. My life is a mess. And you know what? There's, I know a lot of people that are willing to forget about the things they're going through in order to encourage those Christians, those believers, their brother and sister. But that person asking and asking that needs to be aware and understand passages like this. They also must encourage Finally, Paul's words should prompt us to pray for the salvation of the lost and to strive to share the good news of the gospel with those who are headed for eternal judgment. We should pray because we see here how Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers regarding the certainty of eternal judgment, and the blessed offer of eternal salvation through faith in Jesus. Unbelievers will be caught by surprise in the day of the Lord because they feel safe and secure in their unbelief. The salvation of lost sinner isn't something which we can accomplish no matter how persuasive we think our words are. We can't accomplish it just because we think we're smart and because we think we're witty or because we think that, again, we, we have the right persuasive words. Friends, God must open up the hearts of sinners to see their sin, the certainty of divine judgment, and to embrace or in other words, to choose to make that choice to make Jesus their Savior. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The only way lost sinners will be saved is if someone takes the good news of the gospel to them. And if the Spirit of God opens their heart to receive the gift of salvation, wow, and they accept it, they, they, they say, yes, I'm, I, I'm ready to receive it. What a glorious and wonderful thing. Because another sinner has been saved from hell. That ought to make you happy. That ought to, you ought to rejoice. Even if your worst enemy, person, you, you, the person you, you can think of at the top of your head that you just can't stand being around, they come to know Christ. You should be happy for them. You should embrace them. And then they're your brother in Christ now. And, and look for ways to encouraging them by maybe inviting them to church you know, leading them where they can, you know, go to a Bible study and, and maybe sharing scripture with them. Again, what a glorious thing when a believer, when an unbeliever gets saved. This time of waiting isn't only a time to be watching, but it's also a time to be working doing what God has given us to do, doing what God has given you to do. Many of those things will be listed in the verses that we'll be covering next time. But we, you must be intent on doing them. Are you intent on doing them? Are you helping people? Are you leading people to the cross? 
Are you encouraging, you know, telling them, especially if you love and care for them? Are you telling them, hey, you know what? I care for you so much that I don't want you to spend eternity suffering in hell. Keep in mind that if you're born again, whether you're a man, a woman, a teenager, you've been commissioned. You've been commissioned. Share the gospel. It's one of your responsibilities as a believer. Showing people, letting people know that they're completely lost without Jesus. And I want to ask those that are watching and listening, do you now see your need for a Savior? Do you now see that without Christ, without Christ you're completely lost? You're in the bondage. You're being bound. You're in shack the shackles of sin and death. If you're ready to be freed, if you're ready to make Jesus your Lord and Savior and to be forgiven of all your sins, I invite you to the cross. To receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be born again. So if you're ready to do that, you're ready to know and be assured of that when you pass away, that you will be with the Lord. And you want to be now, you now want to be a child of God. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, with all sincerity. I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you for forgiveness. I believe now that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I repent, I turn from my sins, and I confess you and you alone as my Lord, my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me Fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me, teach me, and show me how to live an obedient life for you, how to, to, to read the scriptures I, I, and how to fall in love with you even more. Thank you for being my Savior. In your name, Amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.